as uh, all of you here, yeah, all of us here, yeah. Professor Martin is a uh, world famous linguist. The top is the long list of academic titles, and uh, it's not necessary for me to uh, <coughs> give all these uh, titles. Okay? But uh, what, what I want to say is that. Uh, Professor Martin was my student, uh, was my teacher. <laughs> I, 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 you know, uh, unconsciously renewed my ambition. Right? <laughs> was my teacher 30 years ago when I was a student back at Sydney University. Uh, he is still my teacher, answering many, many of my questions. Okay? And of course, he will be my teacher for the rest of my life. In my mind, he's not only uh, a teacher, and not only a friend, but a great thinker and a creator. Because he put forward so many new theories, original ideas. And we all know uh, appraisal system, positive discourse analysis, individuation, and so on and so forth. Okay? So I'm sure this lecture today will give us a lot of new information, a lot of uh, new uh, <coughs> ideas about uh, uh, knowledge building, especially knowledge building in school situations. Now, Professor Maltese. Okay, thank you very much. It's um, not working. Yes, yes. Oh, close. Did you have to hold close, close. Wow. Rolled it up. <laughs> okay. Nice to be back in my second home. So nice to see you all again. Thanks for coming. Okay, so I'm going to look at, um, uh, talk to a research project that I'm engaged in at Sydney looking at junior secondary history uh, and biology teaching. Uh, begin by introducing you to the theories that are informing this research and then reinforce some of the things that Julian Chun talked to you about yesterday in terms of semantic waves, and then I'll talk about how we tried to translate these ideas into a discourse that would work for the content teachers, the history and biology teachers, uh, or other content area teachers in secondary school. Okay, so informing theories first. It's a joint research project informed by linguistics and sociology, specifically systemic functional linguistics, and legitimation code theory. And it's focusing on knowledge building in junior, secondary, biology, and history. More specifically, a dialogue between SFL, okay, and one particular iteration of SFL with a stratified content plane and a discourse semantics, that kind of model. In relation to one application of this model in language education, referred to by Americans and now by everyone as the Sydney School. And David Rose and I have an introduction to that now, and there's a couple of other great books that have come out of Australia in the last couple of years as well, by Helen de Silva Joyce, Susan Pease, and also Ben Derbank and Pauline Jones. So I think our pedagogy is very accessible now uh, in ways it wasn't until a couple of years ago. Dialogue with Carl Maton's Legitimation Code Theory. And that's his book, which came out this year, called Knowledge and Knowers. Uh, book that's published in China before too long. Uh, very good writer, very amusing writer, and one of the most important books of this um, decade, I'm sure. He describes his approach as a realist, social realist approach that builds most directly on the ideas of Basil Bernstein and Pierre Bourdieu. Integrates insights from sociology, Durkheim, Marx, Weber, and Foucault, SFL, philosophy, Karl Popper, and critical realism, early cultural studies, anthropology, especially Mary Douglas and Ernest Keller, and other approaches. And that's the little icon that he uses to be uh, an emblem for his ideas. <coughs> Dialogue has been from 2002 intensively when Karl first came to Australia. And he's now working at the University of Sydney and living in my home suburb, and so we have lots of chance to attract together. There have been publications uh, from workshops based on this dialogue. 
one friend, Christy, and I edited called Language, Knowledge, and Pedagogy. And from a later workshop edited by a friend, Christy, and Carl Mason called Disciplinarity. And Carl's currently editing a third volume with Sue Wood and uh, uh, South African colleague, uh, Knowledge Building, which will be explicitly about the dialogue between SFL and LCT in general terms across quite a range of fields. And the particular work I'm talking to, a special issue of Linguistics of Education, was published uh, a couple of years ago, 200, 2013, and you can have a look at um, more detail at the papers in that volume of that journal. Okay, the project could be seen as an elaboration of Sydney School genre-based literacy programs, such as Reading to Learn, David Rose's program, uh, with a focus on field alongside genre. So, as well as mapping the genres for each discipline in the junior secondary school, we've also been concerned, because of the concern with knowledge building, to map the kinds of knowledge in the different disciplines and how it might be able to be built in those subject areas. So, a strong field focus balancing the earlier curriculum pedagogy focus on genre. Today I'll be exploring field and the nature of knowledge that um, Sydney School programs help students learn. Uh, in particular, the nature of explanations in lessons and units of work that build knowledge with students accumulating understandings of the field. General issue here is what Carl Majin calls knowledge blindness in Western education. The idea that we have reading, writing, listening, speaking, learning, uh, reading, to learn, to comprehend, to pass, to do things, but it's always completely intransitive. No one ever seems to be articulating or asking what it actually is that we're reading, writing, talking about, listening to, uh, being assessed about, and so on. So we're trying to fill that gap, systematic gap. Okay, so let's look at what explaining means from this point of view. And I'll start with an example from biology from junior secondary school. So the teacher says, okay, what are the cilia? What was it? No? A? Do you know what cilia is? No? D? Someone must know what they are. She's reviewing work now. And one of the students says, hairs. And another student says, the little hairs. And the teacher says, yeah, the little hairs. And this teacher does something, unfortunately, rather exceptional, which is to then consolidate this understanding on the board as part of a table, cilia, the hair-like projections from cells lining the air passages, and they move with a wave-like motion to move pathogens from the lungs until it can be swallowed into the acid of the stomach. And the students are able to copy this down or perhaps get a handout and consolidate their knowledge that they've talked about orally. Well, in Nathan's terms, what we would be looking at there is what he refers to as a semantic wave with something that is more abstract and technical being unpacked into something that is more everyday and familiar and then critically repacked up into something uh, that would constitute a piece of biological knowledge. So a little more abstractly, we have a conceptual term unpacking of the term into everyday language, and repacking of descriptions into a table of terms. Here's a comparable example from ancient history, also in your secondary. So there would be massive amounts of trade going on, and you know, people visiting their diplomats, you know, or their ambassadors, like their envoys and things going like that, all going back and forth across the countries. So here, massive amounts of trade is unpacked as people visiting, envoys going back and forth, and not repacked at the stage yet. If we push on, so ideas. Um, when you get trade and ideas, you wouldn't have heard this word before. We call it aesthetic trade. We're talking about here the influence of Greek on Roman culture. So here, we can see massive amounts of trade being pushed up to trade in ideas and then technicalized as aesthetic trade, the knowledge consolidated in this 
understanding. Okay, so from a linguistic point of view, that's the sociological model. The question, of course, is how does language do it? What I'll do now is turn to this and I'll frame the discussion in terms of the way we try to translate the linguistics for teachers. In this context, referring to the power of words of their discipline and to the power of grammar. And I'll start with biology. Remember, we're working in a context in Australia where all knowledge about language has been removed from the curriculum by the progressivist and constructivist educators who argued that it was useless and harmful. You have nothing to start with as a linguist. So Whenever you come with a linguistic insight, you have to think, how can I render that meaningful for people who have no conscious knowledge of language whatsoever? So here, a little longer passage, and I'll just take you a little further. The little hairs, basically, they need in an upward motion from inside your body out through your nose. Teachers waving her arms up and down to show what's happening. So they beat up, and they take the pathogens away with them. And guys, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but when you smoke cigarettes, the tar actually causes your cilia to be, because it's so heavy, to drop. And so your cilia won't work prop properly after that because they're too heavy, they've dropped, so they can't beat the pathogens out of your body. So that's the, one of the reasons that smoking is bad as well. Okay, all right, write this down on the description. So there's the little consolidation we saw before, and that's actually part of quite a big table that she's using to consolidate this knowledge around the body's lines of defense against um, infection, bacteria, and so on. <coughs> Including skin, mucous membrane, chemical barriers, and other body secretions. So power words. What are power words? This is the most visible part of the uncommon sense knowledge of any secondary school discipline. Uh, in SFL terms, they are technical terms. In LCT terms, they involve a kind of semantic condensation. So we're looking at things like cilia, pathogens, and so on. But we have to remember that there's a lot more to the understanding of any technical term than its definition or its simple unpacking into more everyday phrasing. There's also composition, for example. How is it related to other parts and wholes? For example, we might physiologically be interested in where the cilia are in the body, and here we're concentrating on the ones in the breathing apparatus. Or we might be interested in looking at cilia under a microscope, augmented vision to see what they look like uh, with that kind of technology. Oh, we might go further and through various sorts of experimentation and coloring and maybe electron microscopes and uh, that kind of thing, be able to get a uh, diagrammatic, at least cross-sectional view of the structure of one of the little cilia protruding from a cell. So we have the whole general question of the part-whole relations around any technical term since all the concepts are going to be configured in terms of parts and holes as part of their meaning. And it's a question of how far you go in either direction in the discipline, in that unit of work, in that lesson. At the same time, all of these concepts are cross-classified in another way, taxonomically, into class and subclass relations, and they may be multiply classified in these terms. Classification we're very familiar with in biology from the general Linnaean framework of kingdom, final, class, and so on. So it's a general question here, are we classifying, subclassifying things or classifying them into larger or general categories? So there is my best take, uh, based on wiki only, I'm sorry, of uh, what we're talking about here. So some kind of organelle, eukaryotic cell, and the cilia are a small protuberance from a eukaryotic cell. And they may either be motile or non-motile. The non-motile ones are essentially for sensing chemical environment of the cell. 
facilitate chemical reactions. And the motile ones may either involve a flagella, a whip action for propulsion, like sperm, to fertilize an egg, or the ones that we were dealing with, the wave-like motion of the cilia that move things on, move other objects on. It's a bit strange from a linguistics point of view. The term cilia is actually used at two different points, as far as I can tell. In the classification system, something we try to avoid as linguists, but maybe don't always succeed. But, um, the critical thing here is these oppositions. So there's another simultaneous kind of understanding. At the same time, as I said, there could be different principles for classification. For example, uh, alongside that way of thinking about things in evolutionary genetic terms, we might think about them functionally in terms of their defense capabilities. So we have generally here this notion of non-specific and specific lines of defense, or first, second, and third lines they're talked about. And cilia are over here in the defense barriers, the things that help to keep the pathogens away. We're not worried about how we attack the pathogens with um, microphages and things once they get in through these barriers, and we're not worried about our immune response system at this stage. Okay. So this would be classifying cilia as that first line of defense barriers. And there's different of these fantastic diagrams you find with the taxonomy over here on the left and then various sorts of multimodal resources to deepen your understanding of these processes. Technical terms that I've been talking about so far refer to entities, but technical terms can also refer to activities, implication sequences, processes, if you like, things going on in a field, things like inflammation, phagocytosis, engulfment, related to what we're talking about here. They may be tiered in various ways, so there are various levels of activity. Inflammation has various stages, increased diameter and permeability of blood vessels, phagocyte migration and phagocytosis, tissue repair, just various things your body does to recover from the attack. Again, we might have various kinds of diagrams that focus on particular parts of this, the bacteria entering through the barrier, and then what happens when the blood vessels dilate so that the macrophages can squeeze out between uh, the capillary walls and attack the bacteria out here and engulf them, gobble them up, neutralize them in that way. And we might look in more detail still at how a phagocyte destroys one of these pathogens. Building more detail into our activity sequence, so a more detailed tier of analysis. And put it all together, not all of it, but put a lot of it together in one of these aggregating diagrams. easier perhaps to understand if I rearrange it a little. And what we're doing here is blowing up the permeability of the blood vessels. And then here we're blowing up here what actually happens <coughs> in terms of killing off the bacteria. The board notes for this inflammatory response, fever helps reduce the reproduction of pathogen cells in localized areas. There is increased blood flow to the infected area due to vasodilation, widening of capillaries. This means more phagocytes and macrophages can quickly travel to the infection site. Now, the essential problem that we have to get over here with the secondary school teachers you can think of as logocentrism. Uh, the idea that the problem is words that the students don't understand. Individual words are then in the lessons typically picked out, discussed one at a time, unpacked into common sense. Very little is said about their composition, their classification, their participation in activity sequencing and so on, other than a little bit that might be part of the definition. So you don't get sort of a holistic picture of the meaning of any one of these difficult words. It focuses just on the word itself. I don't know if you're familiar with trying to, this kind of teaching device, which is called an ideas map or a mind map. What essentially you do in linguistic terms is just collocate words with one another because they belong to the same semantic field. 
the lines don't represent particular relationships. I can illustrate this for you with a mind map for grammar uh, from a news story where there is one school and one teacher in a school who is attempting to reintroduce some knowledge about language back into the curriculum. And the little mind map of terms is over here, grammar, with all of these uh, grammar terms um, tied to it with collocation lines. If I blow it up a little bit for you, it looks like this. You have grammar, you have verbs and tenses, adverbs, connectives, morphemes, prepositions, adjectives, and so on. No linguist is going to look at this and see it as a reasonable representation of the grammatical organization of English or any language. It's a splash of terms on the board, traditional terms, that might be relevant. So for example, grammar has a line going to morphemes, so you might expect another line going to words, but that doesn't happen. You have another line going to nouns, and then another line going to pronouns, which are, well, maybe a kind of noun or another kind of nominal, and then we have a line going for abstract nouns that you might expect to be connected to nouns. It's just, um, collocation is all it is. It's not knowledge. It's not knowledge of how the grammar is organized. To the extent that the teachers move beyond focusing on one at a time on the particular words, they're very likely only to use a mind map of this kind. So in summary, knowledge is not a word salad. The teachers' understanding of knowledge seems to be that their discipline is made up of a bag of words which need to be explained one at a time. Okay, rather the words encode specific relations of composition, classification, and sequencing among any of the technical terms, entities proposed by the discipline. If you ride back up the semantic wave and you try to integrate the knowledge the way the teacher did in that table that I introduced you to earlier, you're on your way to integrating the knowledge, but that kind of step is um, unfortunately very rare. So you might understand that cilia are little pairs, but not very much about how they're composed or decomposed, not very much about their classification, and not very much about the role they play in the sequences that are critical to the discipline. So we did try to intervene with some classrooms, and there's a little cartoon drawn by one of the students focusing on the importance of power words in biology. This brings us to power grammar, uh, to nominalization, or more specifically experiential metaphor. And logical metaphor we'll come to in a little while, which is, you can think of it in. SFL comment on LCT, it's an anti-gravity machine. It's a way of uh, making things more lexically dense and to uh, lighten the gravity of a term. Now, examples related to what we're talking about, the reproduction of pathogen cells, increased blood flow, Vasodilation here, the widening of capillaries, the infection site, and so on. These may or may not be marked by Romance philology, depending whether English borrowed them from the French after the French destroyed their vertical discourse, or we just use a regular English word, the more typical English way of transcategorizing. Okay, reproduction of pathogen cells, reproducing pathogen cells, increased blood flow, the blood flow increases, the blood flows more quickly, voluminously. You do note when you try to unpack some of these that it's hard to get exactly the same meaning if you switch from the written form, nominalized metaphorical form, to the spoken form. Lose something. As a dilation, the capillaries dilate or widen if we use a word day term, the infection side, the spot that's infected, and so on. So there's work to be done, just translating back and forth between the congruent and metaphorical form, the spoken and more written form, if you like, and the students seem to cotton on pretty quickly once you point this out to them, that um, there's a kind of form that consolidates the knowledge and also is prestigious in academic discourse and a form that's more the everyday way of talking about these things. Now, this becomes very important because disciplines very highly value in Western culture what they call explanation, which means uh, explaining cause-effect relations in some way or another. 
and the grammatical metaphor is a very powerful resource for both packaging up information as cause and effect and also uh, nuancing the kind of relationships between cause and effect that you need. So, for example, fever helps reduce the reproduction of pathogen cells. There's increased blood flow due to vasodilation. This means more phagocytes and macrophages can quickly travel to the site. So, there may be verbs involved, there may be prepositions involved, but various ways in which the grammar has for realizing these causal relations inside the clause. Basic idea is instead of the spoken reasoning between clauses, something happens and so something else happens because something happens in order for something to happen. Instead of that spoken reasoning with causal relations specified between the clauses, it's as if the conjunction system says, okay, I'm going to hand over to transitivity, I'm going to let the transitivity system map these cause-effect relations, and then you have the full power of your transitivity system in the language, which is a more sophisticated way of thinking about cause and effect. So fever here helps reduce the reproduction of pathogen cells in localized areas, just a single clause to specify the causal relation. Again, there's increased blood flow due to vasodilation. Again, to explain inside the clause rather than between. And then you might use text reference to package up quite a lot of information and make it the cause of something else. And I could have said that more abstractly by nominalizing this part of the clause. This means more efficient phagocyte and macrophage movement to the infection site. So this is the general motif here, cause in the clause, because of its power to pack up things into causes, pack up lots of meaning into effects, and relate the two inside the clause. Uh, and this is the kind of um, agnation, the kind of switching, the kind of movement between spoken and written, or a kind of map of the semantic waves in a sense too, of expressing things in the more nominalized form than less nominalized, and then hopefully packing it back up again. these get more and more dense, the unpacking becomes more and more complex, intricate, if you like. Fever helps reduce the reproduction of pathogen cells in localized areas. There is increased blood flow to the infected area due to vasodilation, widening of capillaries. This means more phagocytes and macrophages can travel quickly to the infection site. So body temperature rises, and so pathogen cells reproduce more slowly in localized areas, and so blood flows more voluminously to the infected area, because the capillaries widen and dilate, and so more phagocytes and macrophages it becomes very long-winded. You run out of breath before you get to the end of the explanation. Okay, so let's just switch over to the humanities now and look at history discourse and understand a little bit about how it differs and resembles science in the way it uses language to build and operate with power words, power grammar. So historians also obviously make use of power words specialized in technical terms. Lycian society, New Kingdom Egypt, the Augustan Age, Garam, Forum, Gaul, and so on. We're working on ancient Rome here. In relation to composition, history is probably comparably technical compared to science in the division of time into periods and cultures into societies. So we have ancient societies, Old Kingdom Egypt, Persian society at the time of Darius and Xerxes, Mycenaean society or historical periods, New Kingdom Egypt to the death, the Greek world, Rome, the Augustan age, and so on. A fairly elaborate part whole uh, taxonomies of societies and periods of time. Also, very precise in relation to maps, especially of archaeological sites. 
And again, comparably precise in terms of buildings we might find on those sites. History also involves a range of what I call specialized terms. They're not really that abstract, but they're unfamiliar because they come from another time, another place, from another culture. So the students will not have heard of this kind of fish sauce, garum, or they may know, not know where Gaul is as an old name for kind of where France is now, or they may have idea of an inn or a tavern they've never heard of, or a peddler. They've certainly in Sydney never seen a peddler in their life. And these have to be explained as well. Garam is a type of fermented fish sauce, was an essential flavor in ancient Roman cooking. And we know about it because of the frescoes and the vessels that have been found. Pompeii, for example. Prepared from intestines of small fishes, macerated in salt and cured in the sun for one to three months, where the mixture fermented and liquefied in the dry warmth the salt inhibiting the common agents of decay. So you know quite a bit about it and how it was uh, made, manufactured. But these specialized terms tend not to be fully composed or decomposed or classified and subclassified as in biology. We don't learn precisely how garum fits into an exhaustive account of the diet in Pompeii, for example. But rather it's important because of the evidence we have the artifacts, frescoes, written evidence reflecting its significance in the economy of Pompeii. So here, under trade with Pompeii, we have Garam mentioned as one of the key export industries for Pompeii. Then history has a number of um, what strike a linguist as less technical terms related to society and culture. They're also much less thoroughly composed and decomposed, classified and subclassified. And I refer to these informally from a linguist's point of view as flexi-tech. They're a kind of technicality that um, has rather loosely defined borders and can be used then to apply to quite a range of situations and perhaps even taken up and um, redefined and used in a different way by another writer looking at another uh, field of inquiry. By these words, I mean economy, culture, social structure, politics, religion, or in terms of economy, trade, commercial trade, aesthetic trade, commerce, industries. I put these little et ceteras here because when you work through the textbooks and the syllabi, there are sort of different listings of what matters, and um, you're never sure if you've got to the end of the list, and you're also not sure why the lists are different in different textbooks in different curriculum documents, in different classroom materials. For example, if we take up the idea of cultures, this is a little bit hard, the influence of Greek and Egyptian cultures. What does that mean? What would the influence of Greek and Egyptian cultures mean, okay? No idea, right? What it means is, if we started to look at all the things in Pompeii and Herculaneum, what objects may be showing Greek design? or Egyptian design, or Greek mythology, or Egyptian mythology, or what building techniques like columns, are there Greek columns? Do you know, are the themes of their artwork reflecting it? So it's saying, remember when we started, we said that Pompeii had originally been settled by Greeks, okay? It looks hard, they're looking at an exam question. But all you gotta do is look and think what things are there. Let me give you a big clue. Some of them are massive, and she started singing, la la la. Theaters, the students say. Uh, theaters, okay, theaters are a Greek design. The Greeks invented the theater, and then the Romans take the idea because they like it too. So some of these things are very obvious. So what is a culture then? Based on that little bit of discourse, it's designs, mythology, building techniques, artwork, examples of a building technique, um, themes of artwork, this kind of theater reflecting this kind of architectural design. These things are evidence of culture, or what exactly is the relationship here? It's the kind of thing that frustrates me as a linguist, where I want things to be much better defined and much more clearly classified. But for people coming from the humanities, they're far more comfortable with a little more of a flexibility around terminology. 
Similarly, if we looked at our trade passage, where we worked our way through to aesthetic trade, what is trade? Well, we seem to have in this lesson, at least, commercial trade and aesthetic trade. Aesthetic trade is people visiting, diplomats going back and forth. We would think some other things as well. Also, there's more technicality of history than we had originally recognized in our early work once we turned our attention to senior secondary history, modern history, for example, isms. Okay? So, working in senior secondary history, uh, you come across all these kind of terms, capitalism, communism, Marxism, socialism, democracy, despotism, and its uh, various forms, imperialism, nationalism, internationalism, and so on. And these are very often defined. Capitalism is an economic and social system under which most of the means of production are controlled by private individuals or companies. They're pretty canonical flexi-tech. You can use them and make them mean what you want them to mean. This helps, I think. You can apply them then to the Cold War, to Indochina, to Palestine. Quite a range of historical situations. And some of them do seem to enter into some taxonomic oppositions, for example, capitalism and communism. As Carl Mason would say, there also the isms tend to be charged with value. They're axiologically charged. And I can illustrate this for you from a little uh, amusing interaction between a teacher and student. So one of the students is not paying attention and I was being called up for it. And the teacher says, where are we? David, you're sitting there by yourself. Can you tell us about communism, okay? And David says, don't make me do that. That's against my Christian beliefs. <laughs> As a joke. Now, being a Christian doesn't have anything directly to do with being a communist or a capitalist, but um, he's making a little joke about the axiological charge around communism and its opposition to, say, democracy all these axiologically charged oppositions that are set up that aren't descriptions of the actual economic system, but are just saying, I like it, I don't like it, as a system. Turning from the relatively sparse and awfully weakly classified technicality of history to abstraction, we encounter discourse that relies even more on power grammar than science. Instead of Mount Vesuvius erupting, you're going to talk about the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. When did he excavate Pompeii? His excavation of Pompeii. He died. His death. And I think the reason for this is it's very crucial for explanation in history. In terms of packaging up complex causes and effects, uh, it's a powerful resource. So consider this little passage. Andrew Wallace states that while Pompeii is one of the most studied of the world's archaeological sites, it is perhaps the least understood due to past neglect, damage, and a failure to document carefully, if at all. So here's the little preposition inside the clause, the circumstance, specifying the causal relation. And then we pile up these three experiential metaphors to consolidate the causes into one mega cause that we're interested in. We also get um, this kind of discourse from managing time. <coughs> the revolution at Pompeii in regards to archaeological methods began with the early stage of occupation. Okay? So here, the temporal relationship is being realized verbally inside the clause, relating these two experiential metaphors there cause in the clause more common, but you do find time managed inside the clause as well. So it's crucial, as I say, for explanation, for packaging up things. Fear early stage of occupation allowed for greater documentation, more archaeological artifacts left in sight, and the breakthrough process of injecting li liquid plaster into the body-shaped cavities made by solidified ash and the eventual decomposition of bodies. So here we're going the other way. Here's the cause, and then that's the effect on the semantically loaded effect with at least three different subsections all built into the clause. 
we can unpack the nominalizations and so on. Uh, and it's important for teaching these things to students to give them the spoken and written form of how these things work. But if we do so, our ability to package up events as complex cause and complex effect is severely compromised. Here, that example we worked on, we want to have all of these three uh, as the cause, the due to, relates to why Pompeii is the least understood site. And here, we have the multiple effects. Beyond this, cause in the clause enables nuanced interpretation. Historians can borrow dozens, maybe hundreds of verbs into that verb slot to produce finely nuanced types of explanation. For example, did Fiorelli's stage of occupation allow for all these things? Did it encourage all these things? Did it contribute to all these things? Did it precipitate all these things? You don't just have and so, and so, and so anymore. You have very subtle, complex kinds of cause-effect relations. Uh, this is one reason why history becomes more metaphorical than science. Science doesn't have this. Science likes one kind of cause, thank you very much, not hundreds of kinds of cause. But for historians, to have a sophisticated explanation, you do want hundreds of kinds of cause. Okay, and the final step I need to take is to introduce the last of the power trio, power composition, which will be pretty familiar to most of us, I think, in one way or another. Uh, it's related to the general notion of periodicity, Pike and Halliday's notion of the clause as waves of information. I understand Ji Young Chun reviewed this with you. The notion of peaks of thematic and news prominence in the clause, and then layers of preview that you can build up in an edited, planned, written text, and layers of consolidation. To my surprise, this uh, had already been discovered by McDonald's before I articulated it. And if you Google hamburger writing on the web, you'll come through all sorts of American websites that try to explain periodicity as a kind of hamburger. So we have the topic sentence and the concluding sentence, and then we have the details and examples in between as the filling. And we have big Macs as well. Macro theme, macro new, and then our paragraphs, each potentially with their own hyper theme, hyper new structure. Um, our teachers actually have different versions of this point. Um, elaboration example, P, they call it. Uh, uh, we can use the hamburger to illustrate the periodicity thing. So, okay, it wasn't too hard to get up and get the teachers to use. Some of them are already doing something similar, uh, getting them to use that. Uh, in terms of students' writing. So, for example, if we had to write uh, an essay about conserving Pompeii, and we had our textbook and other kinds of source material, perhaps given as handouts if textbooks aren't used anymore, we could then write an essay which would have a structure of this kind. It's a factorial explanation. While Pompeii is one of the most studied of the world's archaeological sites, it's been plagued with serious conservation problems, including poor restoration work, damage from vegetation, pressure from tourism, and poor site management. And then we can um, unpack each of those into one of the factors in this genre. So much of the restoration work has been done by local firms with no specialized knowledge. A second problem is the incursion of uncontrolled weeds. It's a tourist attraction, bringing all these visitors, and finally there's been no overall management plan, and then we elaborate those in those paragraphs. And then we can wrap up. As a result of these factors, the destruction of Pompeii, the description of Pompeii is a victim of state neglect and indifference, and an archaeological catastrophe of the first order is an apt one. Its ongoing destruction since its discovery in the 1590s has arguably resulted in a greater disaster than its initial destruction by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius one and a half millennia later earlier. So 
So if we think about this, what's going on, you have the introduction and conclusion, or technically macro theme, macro new. And these paragraphs all have a hyper theme, but no hyper new. So we add up the different reasons, then we elaborate between the um, hyper theme and the text there. So that would be a canonical SFL analysis. And obviously, you can have as many layers depending on the length of the text and how much scaffolding you provide. Interfacing this with LCT is interesting in that the to compose the macro themes and the macro new, you need very dense semantic density and relatively low semantic gravity. You have to get up and have lots of content at a fairly general abstract level. Then you can, you know, as you unpack in the paragraphs, you're moving down to something that's less dense and more everyday concrete and so on. So you can see that the waves that we're looking at in the classroom discourse are actually a model of the way in which you would organize a text in terms of periodicity. Okay, Moving down from your more abstract generalizations, parceling them out, getting down to the concrete evidence and so on, and then moving back up again to consolidate what you've done. This has the effect of um, giving a lot of power to your writing in the sense that you have the values and insights and generalizations, but you can back them up with the concrete evidence as well and do that in this kind of wave-like pattern. And you're signposting your genre structure and the structure of your paragraphs very clearly for anyone who has to evaluate it or harvest information from it. <coughs> Critically, power words and power grammar are absolutely essential for forming the higher level themes and news if you don't have the power words and power grammar, you don't have the ability to uh, consolidate knowledge at a high level of abstraction, so you can't actually scaffold and compose your text in these terms. Okay, so just um, thinking about the implications of what we're talking about here and what the practical consequences might be trying to get from the functional linguistics and the sociology back into teaching practice. So basically what ideally we would be looking at is something like this. Uncommon sense information is stored in writing. Students have to be able to access that writing. There's various ways in which they're expected to access it in Australia. Traditionally by the textbook, but textbooks are not widely used anymore, unfortunately. More likely is that the teacher copies, Xeroxes, handout from one or another textbook or some web-based materials and hands it out to the students asking them to read it before the next class or in class. Or there may be web-based materials or they may be told to just go to the web and find something about a particular topic. Ideally then in the classroom interaction you would expect the texts that you're dealing with and the things that are difficult to understand in them to be unpacked and repacked and then unpacked and repacked and unpacked, repacked, but ascending until you get to the point where, hopefully, the teacher in notes on the board or in a genre-based pedagogy in modeled joint writing with the students shows you how to pack up the knowledge that's been discussed orally into high-stakes writing. I'm just using this high-stakes term that our American colleagues use for talking about the reading that matters in academic discourse and the writing that matters in terms of assessment. What we actually find 90% of the time in the Australian junior secondary school is this down escalator. Okay. You take a word from the reading that you think the students can understand, like cilia, and describe it as little hairs. Then you take pathogen, turn that into everyday discourse. Then you take phagocyte, turn that into everyday discourse. There's no integration of knowledge across the top here. It's incredibly segmental. It's very, very logocentric, and what the idea is is that we just keep dumping the students back into common sense by way of engaging with them, which is fine, okay, but leaving them there. There's no repacking into the kind of construal of knowledge, construction of knowledge that they started with, and it's highly segmental. Reading is not taught, 
in our secondary schools. The assumption is that students have learned to read in primary school. That may or may not be true in terms of the kind of reading they're expected to do in primary school. But it's a problem because the reading they have to do in secondary school is of a completely different order. And it's not taught. The classroom discourse essentially dumps them into common sense. And they're not taught to write. Again, the idea seems to be they've learned to write in primary school. We know the genres and the kind of level they're writing the genres at in primary school is nothing comparable to what they need for a secondary school. But the secondary school content teachers don't teach writing or reading. And the English teachers don't teach reading or writing that's relevant to the content areas. Indeed, our English teachers in Australia, because of their love of literature, and story writing and poetry writing would think that it was really not their responsibility to even engage in any way with the discourse of the other disciplines. <coughs> so there are alternatives. We could teach reading using one kind of genre-based pedagogy or anything would be helpful that would give students access to the academic discourse they're trying to read. We could, again, teach writing, using reading to learn, or whatever we want to do to actually do that. Um, and in that sense, we'd be making sure that the students can unpack, harvest information from the things they're required to read, and repack it into the kind of things they're going to be assessed on. And when I want to be um, a little bit provocative, I would say to the content teacher, the talk that you're actually doing now, picking out word after word you think the students don't understand, and turning it into con common sense, everyday terms, is not very productive. It's incredibly inefficient. It's not actually integrating knowledge in a way that it needs to be integrated. Why don't you just stop? If you would just teach reading and teach writing all of the time, you would get far, far more content across to your students than what you're doing now. This would be my counter to the content teachers, all of whom say, I don't have time to teach reading. I don't have time to teach writing. You know, I'm too busy. The syllabus is too full. I have to get through all this material. I don't have time. But if you sit and listen to their lessons hour after hour, or they play, guess what's in my head about the technical term? What are cilia? Come on, what do you think cilia are? I'll give you a hint. And on that goes for five minutes till we dump the students into common sense. It's, uh, not a very efficient way of moving through things. Okay, so I think ideally we would want to be able to teach high stakes reading. We want to get students to the point where they can actually listen to a fairly monologic lecture. Certainly in our observations when we look at the prestigious schools in Australia working at the end of high school, uh, we see in those schools more of a lecturing format the teacher is monologuing to the students in an oral discourse that those students can understand. And those are the students that are going to be doing very well in the high stakes writing. In the weaker schools, what we have here is the teachers playing this oral discourse, gets what's in my head, involving the students in a lot of hands-on work, doing experiments and things like that, uh, things that don't um, actually mean that you have to teach them to read or don't result in the high stakes writing that the students uh, will need to do well in school. Okay. Well, that's sort of where things sit at present. I think the power trio is a kind of first step in making some contact with the content teachers. If the content teachers are working with a group of students where they're incredibly frustrated about their results, they will come around and devote some time to thinking about the things we're talking about, uh, and we can make some progress, but uh, we have a long way to go. Okay, so there's the Power Trio translation of what I'm talking about today. Uh, and um, I'm not sure how relevant it is to your context here in China, but uh, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. We still have some time for questions. Mm -hmm. Please. Um, I just have a question for you between, between um, what I thought was was um, when you're talking about technical terms, the power words, on the one hand, the teachers, you were saying that it's not enough just to have the technical term, the technical term fits into this whole picture. Yet, 
um, with the students, there is this notion that you need to use the power words. So what's the relationship between those two aspects? Well, I mean, you, you have to start where the teachers are at, and what they recognize is that there are these words that the students don't understand, but when I say bring power words to their attention, I don't just mean focusing on the words the way they do, but think about them in terms of knowledge building, in terms of integration of the compositional relationships, the classification relationships, any activity sequences or implication sequences they're involved in, like flesh them out, and also have a pedagogy that will actually take the knowledge, teach them how to get the knowledge out of the reading materials where it lives and transform it back into, consolidate it back into the kind of writing they're going to be assessed on. So yeah, by power words I mean more than power words. Then. Make the words powerful by dealing with the composition, the classification, and the sequencing. Yeah. More questions? Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, I mean, you'll need a microphone from there with Jeff Old name. curriculum in Australia which emphasizes the fact that the content area teachers have to take language and literacy seriously and do something about it. But like many of these government initiatives, there's no support given to the teachers to actually do something about language and literacy. So what we've noticed is what the teachers might do is have a little passage of text and highlight some words that are spelled wrong and get the kids to spell them right and that counts as tick. I worked on language and literacy. so. The idea that they learn what they need to learn about genre and field and some aspects of things I'm talking about today and a pedagogy that can actually teach reading and writing is just um, far, far away. Our primary school teachers are in pretty good shape. We've managed to change them, but we haven't managed to change the secondary school. Our main problem is that in the education faculties in Australia, the progressivists, they now call themselves constructivist educators, are in control of the curriculum. They have a completely intransitive view of learning learning skills, reading skills, writing skills, everything is a king, I call them inksters, um, to get them to the point where they accept that you know there is something called knowledge, that it's discipline specific, that it has its own language that builds it, to get them to that point is very, very difficult. So probably in the teacher training it's only little pockets, and especially as you say where we have the ESL, uh, second language teachers, English for academic purpose teachers, they will open up more to this. But, um, we haven't got anywhere with the content teachers, especially not with English teachers. Thank you for the questions and the answers. Okay, uh, since time is limited, okay, uh, if you have more questions, please uh, ask Jim after the conference. Okay. Now, uh, just now, uh, Professor Marty gave us uh, a one-hour talk. You know, uh, in this book, you tell us, see. Well, as a teacher or as, as a linguist, how should we deal with uh, school semantics? Okay? Uh, especially how we uh, should deal with uh, power words, power grammar, and power, power composition. And in what way, you see, we should do to, uh, to accumulate, to help our students to accumulate language step by step. Okay? By first, Unpacking, then repacking. Okay? Thank you very much.